Thank you. And ma'am, if you could please state your name for the record. Kylie Osage. Thank you. And good morning to you, ma'am, and good morning to Detective Main as well. With that, you may proceed with your statement this morning, ma'am. Good morning. Um, my name is Kylie Osage. I have attended Oxford Community Schools for my entire life. I often look back at pictures of me and my parents in 2009, walking into my first day of kindergarten. I was so innocent with my Barbie backpack, my My Little Pony lunchbox. At the time, I didn't know what a school shooting was. No child should at that age, let alone experience one. I was so innocent on that first day of kindergarten, and that innocence was taken from me two years ago. I was a senior at Oxford High School on November 30th, 2021. That day began like any other for me. I drove to Oxford Middle School in the morning, where me and my friend Tate Meir and I were partners for Bully Busters, which was a bullying prevention program. Tate and I spoke to sixth graders about bullying in the school environment and how to prevent it. Afterwards, I drove back to the high school where I took a math test. I ate lunch at the same table that I sat at every single day. I made TikToks with my friends in the hallways. Before my fifth hour class, me and my dear friend Riley Franz and I were standing in the hallway socializing with our peers. And all of a sudden, I thought a balloon popped. I turned and I fell right to the ground. I remember hearing screams. I saw running, but I couldn't run. I was already down. I remember hearing Mr. Wolf make an announcement. I had never heard the halls become silent so fast in my life. The silence was deafening. I was laying on my side like this, and I realized what had just happened. I was just shot, and I thought I was going to die. As I laid on the floor, I attempted to get up, but my legs weren't moving. I repeatedly hit my legs with my hands like this in an attempt to regain any kind of feeling, any kind of feeling, but not a single thing. I then somehow tried to do a push-up to somehow drag my body to a safe place where I could get some help. But with the weight of my Carhartt jacket, and my backpack full of laptops and textbooks, I was unable to do so. It was so painful. I let myself drop back down onto the floor where I felt warmth on my face. Warmth from blood soaking into the carpet. I remember hearing a squish sound against my right ear. And it was the sound of carpet mixed with blood going into my ear. I started yelling for help, but when I say yelling, I mean a shout that was loud enough for someone around me to hear, yet quiet enough for the shooter not to hear me. No one ever came, but I did hear something. I reached my hand over my head, and I realized it was Hannah. I could hear her groaning beside me. Realizing that I wasn't alone, I kept trying to reassure her. Someone will come help us. Don't worry. Just keep breathing. Just please stay with me. I said that to her a thousand times. At one point, a SWAT team member came running past us. He was the first person I had seen. 
I pleaded to him, please help us. He did a double take and said, someone will come back for you. Hannah and I were left in utter loneliness. And I thought I was dying. I kept repeating my mom's phone number to make sure my brain was functioning. I was creating math problems in my head and solving them to make sure I wasn't dying. I continued to yell for help. 15, mi 15 minutes of laying there absolutely helpless. 15 minutes of lying in a pool of my own blood. 15 minutes of hearing Hannah St. Juliana's last sounds while stroking her hair and trying to encourage her. When help finally came, they attended to Hannah, attempting to wrap a tourniquet around her. Someone eventually came for me too. I didn't know who it was, but I knew it was a man, and I later learned that that man was Mr. Ken Weaver. Mr. Weaver stayed with me, supporting my head and locating my wounds. He kept pressure on my entrance wound to stop the bleeding. Mr. Weaver fought to keep me awake and alive until the paramedics could attend to me. During the ambulance ride, I kept asking my paramedic, Will I still be able to ride my horses? Will I ever be able to play basketball again? I kept asking these questions to the paramedic in the ambulance. These were my favorite activities while growing up. I was transported to St. Joseph's Hospital in Pontiac, where I stayed into January. During my hospital stay, I spent one week in the intensive care unit and over a month in the rehabilitation unit. The bullet entered me through my right clavicle and exited out the left side of my back. The bullet shattered my right clavicle, broke two of my ribs, and grazed my spine, causing a spinal cord injury. That night, I had an emergency surgery to remove a hematoma from my spinal cord, also to take out the shards of bone from around my spine, along with pieces of clothing that had entered along with the bullet. One week later, I had a clavicle repair surgery where they stabilized my right clavicle with a titanium plate. During my almost five week stay in the rehab unit, I had to train myself to sit up unassisted. I had to relearn how to perform basic life tasks like eating, brushing my teeth, showering and getting dressed. I had to learn to walk again as well as climb stairs. Prior to this event, I was being recruited to ride horses competitively on a college equestrian team. Unfortunately, I could not follow through with this opportunity. I've been riding horses my entire life. I've had several horses throughout my lifetime. They have provided me with years of happiness. Being able to swing a leg over my horse is my therapy. It's pure joy. I have not been able to do this in two years. Before November 30th, I also had a great job working at a golf and country club. I love my job and I love the people there. But unfortunately, I was unable to return to work and have not had a job since due to my disabled condition. I, am, I have not been able to earn any money for myself. Seven months after being discharged, I became a freshman at Michigan State University. where I'm continuing my education, carrying on with my life, because no one is ever gonna stop me from living my life to the fullest. Michigan State has provided me with several accommodations as I am still disabled and in extreme pain every single day. They were able to place me in a dorm that is close to all my classes. They provide transportation for me since walking long distances is a battle. It was a one minute walk to the closest cafeteria. And without these accommodations, I would not have been able to complete my freshman year at Michigan State. This past summer, I underwent another spine surgery where the surgeons fused my C6 to T7 vertebrae 
to stable my spine and correct a progressing deformity resulting from my injury. I was blessed to have found some excellent surgeons in New York City. My family and I spent two weeks recovering in New York. And Your Honor, to make everyone aware, back surgery is so hard. It causes intense pain and struggles. It's impossible to do anything yourself. I needed help just to roll over, sit up, stand up from a chair, get in and out of bed, and sip a glass of water. My two spine surgeries took the life out of me. Besides relearning daily life tasks, I had to stop playing tennis, riding horses, driving, and a whole list of other things that people can take for granted. Hanging out with my friends is hard, as the best I can do is sit down the whole time. I've been on a list of medications for the past two years, and I'm so tired of relying on medications to keep me out of my misery. I also have a thermoregulation disorder resulting from my spinal cord injury. With this condition, I'm unable to stay warm in cold, in cold weather or to keep my cool body warm, or keep my body cool during warm temperatures. This is a difficult condition to cope with as I must keep the weather into consideration when making any plans or just choose to stay indoors. Currently, I'm a sophomore at Michigan State University where all these accommodations are still in place. Even though I am able to attend school, I'm still in constant pain. Every single day when I get out of bed, the physical pain hits me hard. For reference, Your Honor, it has been 738 days of constant physical and mental pain. It has been 738 days without playing basketball or tennis. It has been 738 days of not being able to ride my horse. It has been 738 days of reliving the tragedy in my head every single hour. It has been 738 days of living with PTSD, scared of the thought of someone hurting me again. It has been 738 days of living with survivor's guilt, knowing that I could not save Hannah St. Juliana. 738 days and counting. For the rest of my life, I will live with these struggles. Still to this day, I'm in physical therapy. Twice a week for an hour, I attend therapy, where my therapist helped to ease my ongoing pain. We are also working on regaining all the strength back that I have lost. I will never be able to ice skate again. I will likely never be able to take my future children sledding. I will never be able to ride a roller coaster or jump on a trampoline ever again. I will never be able to participate in intramural sports teams at my school. I will never be able to attend sports in the student section at school as my pain is unbearable during events like these. My life has changed its path entirely. However, Your Honor, I refuse to let the cowardly acts of a person affect the rest of my life. I will continue and live on for those that we've lost. I will continue to walk around MSU's campus strong and proud. I will continue to have compassion and spread love and joy and positivity everywhere I step foot. I will continue to advocate for those that have experienced something similar. I will proceed to stand up against gun violence in hopes that nothing like November 30th ever happens to anyone ever again. And nothing will ever stop me from living my life to the absolute fullest. No one will ever take my happiness away from me because I'm the strongest person I know. Your Honor, I've experienced many blessings and met many angels along this journey. I've come to know the love, compassion, and support of a community. I have so much to be thankful for. I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to stand here before you and tell you my story. I'm so blessed with my family. They have walked with me every single step of the way. And their strength is astounding. During both of my hospital stays, I met so many amazing individuals who have become some of my best friends or my family. 
They've supported me through every single endeavor. They took care of me and poured their hearts into my recovery. I'm beyond grateful for my hospital and healthcare family that have cared for me as if I'm their family. And I'm so fortunate to have some great friends who make changes to their lifestyles just to accommodate mine. Most of all, Your Honor, I'm thankful that I'm still here. I keep my faith and trust in a greater plan. As long as I'm on this earth, I will fight for justice for everyone in this country that has experienced something similar. Please do not let anyone else suffer the impact and trials of our tragedy that we hear about today. Please let there be no opportunity for more tragedy and pain, because no one deserves this. Thank you for your time, and I hope my presence here today will help you make the right decision. Thank you for being here, and your strength and courage in speaking today is nothing short than admirable. So thank you for your statements this morning. Thank you, thank sir, you. for being as well. Thank you. Thank you, people. Judge Miss Riley Franz. <clears throat> Thank you. I just want to confirm that Miss Franz is not a minor. Correct. She's not. Thank you. Good morning, ma'am. If you could please state your name for the record. My name is Riley Franz. Thank you. You may proceed with your statement this morning. I have contemplated how to put November 30th, 2021 into words since the day it took place. How to verbally acknowledge that day's impact, terror, sorrow, and tragedy. How to make a victim's impact statement quite literally. I would, I would love nothing more than to stand up here and say that I have overcome the obstacles of that day and have continued to live my everyday life. But that would be a lie. November 30th has altered my life in every single aspect. It has changed and molded the way I think, the way I feel, and the way I act. I can no longer sleep without having flashbacks of a bullet entering one side of my neck and exiting the other. I feel limited on what I can do at 19 years old because of the thoughts running through my head. My entire existence has been consumed by fear and that I will once again have to experience the pain and the suffering that I felt on November 30th. I used to love attending school, where I would learn and create connections with others. I now experience panic attacks nearly every day when I have to attend university. I can no longer sit in a classroom and focus and take notes like many students around me. Now when I sit, now when I sit at a school, I feel anxious, checking for all my exits, highly in tune with all movements inside and outside the classroom flinching at every sound from the walking upstairs to a, pe to a pencil dropping and counting down the minutes until I feel that I can breathe again. I cannot remember what it's like to feel safe and secure in any space that I occupy. I often cancel plans because I fear leaving the comfort of my home and my family. On the days that I can't get out of bed because I'm afraid when I'm sitting in a restaurant or classroom or even walking to my car, the, imaginable, the unimaginable will happen again. When a balloon pops, a car backfires, or people run past me, my thoughts have been consumed by fear while my body is constantly in survival mode. I mourn the life I once had, which my selfless parents worked so hard to create for my sister and me. Free of hardship, pain, and worry. A life filled with opportunities and fearlessness. I feel that the structure my parents created was burned to the ground that day. Everything I had the privilege of not feeling or fearing is now my daily life. I mourn the childish wonder and carelessness stripped from my little sister, the most fantastic person I've ever had the privilege of sharing life with. I mourn the person I used to be because although I survived, the original pieces of me didn't. I will never have the opportunity to experience life like I used to. 
with so much joy and clarity. The scariest part of November 30th for me was not that day itself, but the days that followed it. On the days that I feel like I am not occupying my body, but watching it from above. I feel like I cannot breathe because I'm paralyzed in a world no one who hasn't experienced something like this could ever imagine. Piece of me shattered that day, and two years later, I am still struggling to put them back into place. But every day, I choose not to allow what a selfish individual decided to do to break me. I, Riley Franz, am a survivor of gun violence. I, Riley Franz, am a survivor of a terrible ec epidemic caused by a broken system. But I refuse to be known as a victim at the hands of an individual with no regard for others. His selfishness will not consume my identity. I am so much more than a victim. I am a daughter to the most amazing parents, Jeff and Brandy. I am a sister to the most remarkable young woman I have ever met, Isabella. I, have a fr I am a friend, a classmate, a cousin, a granddaughter. But most importantly, I am a person. I am a person who deserved to. I am a person who deserved a chance to make it to her fifth class that day. I am a person who deserved to not run in fear while she bled out. Someone who deserved not to have to answer a phone call from her little sister asking if she was safe. I deserved to be a child that day, a student who made it to her class, not someone's target practice. I would never wish what I experienced upon anyone in this world, what my family experienced that day, what I continue to battle daily. No child should have to fear that their school will be next, that they need to know what to do if the worst breaks out in front of them. Children should attend school focused on their studies, friends, aspirations, and dreams. No parent should have to worry that their child is unsafe at a place where they are supposed to learn and prosper. Students should no longer have to learn lockdown drills. Instead, we should work harder to create a system that prevents gun violence and prevents children's lives from being stripped away and leaving only pieces behind.